we always say like knowledge is pleasure. Like the more you know about your body, the more there really is this like comfort in feeling like very good about your body. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are talking about female sexuality, sex toys, and getting to know and better understand your body and what feels good to you. We'll be busting some myths and dropping research-based knowledge. This one is definitely a fun one. Our guest today is Anna Lee. Anna Lee is the co-founder and engineer of Lioness, the world's first and only smart vibrator that improves understanding of sexual pleasure and orgasms through bio biofeedback data and science. She's been recently named Forbes 30 Under 30 alum, as well as Paper Magazine's Asian Woman Creators You Need to Know and BuzzFeed's 14 Sex Tech Founders Who Are Changing the Way the World Thinks About Sex. She's a big advocate in Lioness's mission to expand understanding and research in sexual health and destigmatize female sexuality. Disclaimer, this episode is for people 18 and up. We'll be discussing sex, the female body, and briefly touch on sexual trauma. Hi, Anna. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited. I know. I'm so excited to get into this. You have such an interesting story. I mean, what you do is so cool. Like, first of all, super like, I think progressive and innovative. We'll get into that later. But before we talk about your work, tell us about your background and how you were raised and then Mm. how you kind of Yeah. How, how, I want to hear the story of like how like sexuality and sex was growing up. Yeah, totally. So, um, I was born in California, but when I was a baby, we moved back to Korea. Um, and I lived there till I was seven and then moved back to the U S uh, down in LA. So, um, I grew up in a really conservative, strict, pretty religious Korean family. We never talked about sex growing up. In fact, I was like, so scared of my own body well into my mid twenties. And I have to tell this to people all the time that everything is a journey. And like, I don't like where I am now is just so different than like where I was even like five years ago. But, um, so I, we came to America and it was really this, you know, immigrant mentality and like the, of pursuing the American dream. So my parents really sacrificed everything they had to come to America to give my brother and me a better opportunity here. And I was really like, and that's exactly what I really thought I wanted to do. So I would like studied engineering. So I went to school at UC Berkeley for mechanical engineering. And my goal was to go to like a corporate American job and kind of be there for the rest of my life. So I ended up at Amazon um, in Sunnyvale in the Bay Area. And I was building as a mechanical engineer, like building Kindles and devices on this team called Concept Engineering. And a few years into it, I just remember feeling like, man, this is like what you're supposed to do for the rest of your life. Like, is this really the thing that I'm passionate about? And I, I think it was the first time I realized like I was really living for somebody else. And I felt so indebted to my family, my parents to do this and that I wasn't really living for me. And so, um, with that concoction of me being like scared of my own body, it was one of those like funny life whims where somebody I met was a founder of a different sex toy company. And I was like, and it was a cis het man. And then I was like, how do you know what you're building works for people with vulvas? And he was like, oh, there's this industry standard where you put the vibration on your nose and that's what a clitoris feels like. (laughs) And I just remember being like, I cannot believe the things that are so intimate to us, like is like designed in this way. And that we're basically like, the whole sex toy industry is is historically extremely male dominated. And so I felt like I always had failed my own self of being like scared of my own body and like just feeling so like I didn't know how to have those communication with partners. And I realized it wasn't really me. The system failed us and like our community and our cultural shame and societal shame really failed us. And so that's how I ended up pivoting into like wanting to work on a smart vibrator. And so it's like a little silly. And I also, that I'm always like, I, when people ask like, what is that aha moment? I'm like, oh, like, it's hard to say. Cause it's like a little bit of luck, a little bit of whim and, um, the luck of meeting this guy who was 
the company doesn't exist anymore either. <laughs> but um, yeah, so now I'm kind of working. Uh, I've been in the sex tech space for about seven, almost seven years now. Wow. And how did you meet your co-founder? Because you, there's two of you that started this company, right? Yeah. So there's actually three of us. So it's Liz, James, and uh, me. So uh, it's a really interesting thing that happened was that at the time I was living with my old roommate, um, who I loved to death. And so uh, I was telling her, like, we had this conversation after I met that founder. And I was like, you know, I like really want to engineer like a sex toy. It's such a like as a mechanical engineer, as someone who like loves to like build things, I was like, it's such an organic shape and you use silicone and you have like this motor and you're trying to amplify the motor vibration. I was like, it's such a cool product idea. And she was like, you know, I know these two people that are like kind of working on this idea at the foundry, which is a incubator for UC Berkeley. And so she was like, you should meet them. And so she introduced me to Liz and James. And at the time I was like, I don't want anything. Like, I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for equity. I was like, I just want to do this as a fun side project after my job. Like, I was like, I've learned so much about sensor integration and mechanical design. Like, let me just figure out like how I can help. And so we just really got along and we would hang out, like not hang out, but we would work in this UC Berkeley basement from like, because I would finish work and then go over to Berkeley and work from like 8 p.m. to like 3 a.m. together. Mm -hmm. And we were like, you know, the best bonding times is when you're delusionally tired and like kind of going through the same effort. And so um, I ended up and then I think just after like six, seven months into it, we were like, hey, like, what if we kind of make this into a company and we actually work on this full time? And so uh, I'm super grateful. Like, I think, you know, co-founders are always hard to find and good finding good partners are always really hard to find. And like we've really worked through because we we didn't know each other from before either. So we really worked through figuring out what that looked like for us. Yeah. And so were you saying they were already working on this concept and then you joined in to help build the physical, like, you know, the vibrator? Yeah. So at the time they really like Liz, um, she's our co-founder and CEO. She came from like a sexuality space where she was selling intimacy products. Uh, it was called passion party. So if you've ever like gone to like a bachelor party where they like have a person that comes with like, and shows you all the different sex toys. And she already realized that like a lot of people would ask her so many questions, like beyond like, Oh, which toy should I buy? It was like, Hey, my body does this. Or like, I can't have an orgasm with my partner. Is this normal? And we realized like, both of us coming from she came from the Midwest. So like coming from families where we didn't talk about sex, we realized like, Nobody has the answers in terms of like what what we know about our own bodies. And so at the time, James and Liz wanted to build an AI vibrator. So like it would move and uh, like change vibrations by itself. The more you use it, it got smarter. And then when we were kind of building out that prototype and serving like hundreds of different women, a lot of people were like, you know, that's cool. But like, how are you even getting that information? We're like, oh, we're looking at your biofeedback data on your pelvic floor contractions. And then they were like, wait, what does that graph look like? And we realized this lack of studies around and research around this space, we couldn't even build an AI vibrator if we wanted to, because there's not enough information out there. And so we realized the first step is to even just give a per, uh, like people tools to understand their own bodies through biofeedback data. Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Osea. As you may know, skincare is one of the most crucial parts of my self-care routine. As we move into the drier months, I like to pamper my skin with extra moisture, so I've been incorporating Osea's Andaria Algae Body Oil into my post-shower routine in the evenings. Osea specializes in clean and eco-friendly skincare, with the main ingredient being seaweed. Their products feel so luxurious and make my skin look nourished, healthy, and glowing. Try the Andaria Algae Body Oil in Osea's Total Body Glow Trio Kit. This kit includes body oil, moisturizing body scrub, and a plant-based body brush. All of Osea's products are clean, safe, responsibly sourced, vegan, cruelty-free, and powered by the sea. Find your new skincare and body care favorites at oseamalibu.com and get a special discount just for our listeners. Get 10% off your first order site-wide with promo code TLL. You'll get free samples with every order and orders over $50 get free shipping. You're going to want it all, so go to oseamalibu.com, promo code TLL. 
I think that's something that is so interesting that you're the first smart vibrator and you're actually collecting data, which has not been collected before. So let's get into that. First of all, how is the data collected so that the listeners are clear how it works? And then what what do you do once you have that data? Yeah. So, um, so our company Linus, we make a rabbit style vibrator and a rabbit style is like, it has an insertable portion where it typically is inserted into the vagina. And then there's like a little nub, which is the clitoral nub to stimulate the clitoris, uh, which is one of the most guaranteed ways to have an orgasm. And so, um, one part is inserted. So what we're measuring is pelvic floor contractions. It's one of the best indicators for arousal and orgasms. Um, so in research studies, when there are some, a lot of times the best way that they can measure that at research facilities is measuring the how your v- vaginal walls or anal muscles are squeezing and relaxing involuntarily. So there's a really unique pattern that happens during an orgasm. So basically you use the vibrator completely like a normal vibrator, or you can have it paired to your phone to if you want to see it in real time. And then once you're done, once you sync it to your phone, you get this graph. um, And then you can put different tags like, oh, this is when I was with this partner, or this is when I was, uh, I had two cups of coffee or things like that and add notes. But then other than that, you start getting all these different graphs of your own um, body. And what we encourage the most is like, be your own self-experimenter. So figure out what things work, what doesn't work, what changes over time. Um, And we've had people track even things like concussions and how that affects their orgasms and realizing that there's a correlation there. Um, And so the idea is to get that data and then just see how it changes over time or what makes it different. And like we always say, like knowledge is pleasure. Like the more you know about your body, the more there really is this like comfort in feeling like very good about your body, in my opinion. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of the data portion. We're super, super strict on like data privacy and policies and things like that. Everything's anonymized aggregate data that we're looking at. Um, and we work with researchers to actually like use the data to expand the research in this space. But that's only if as a customer, you're opted in and you've explicitly opted in to do these research studies with us. Right, right. Um, I mean, with this data, what are example, like, I guess one way is self-experimentation. You just learn as you go, but like, I guess how else have you seen this data like enhance people's lives or how can we use this data? Like, I don't know, what what can this data do once we have it, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I will use me as like a, as a, proof point of like, I've been really, I started really being curious. So like, I always tell people also that I didn't really own like sex toys very much when I first started this company. Like I had those like cheapy ones, they were like $20 from like Spencer's, I don't know, this like (laughs) dates me as a human. Yeah, I I get it. (laughs) It Like Spencer's, you know, like those $20 ones. And then, um, so I thought that's all that existed. So in terms of like, like figuring out my body, it really helped me feel comfortable in this, in the sense of like, I never found myself as like a hypersexual person or like that I feel sexy or I present myself in a very sexy way. And I think the most like typical mainstream terms. And so I always felt a little bit like weird, like, oh, like, I don't know if I'm allowed to like really be a sexual being or, and things like that. And for some reason, the nice thing is like, because it's data, it kind of sometimes helps taking that away from it and being like, oh, this is just me like understanding my body better. And I started getting extremely like self-experimental of like, oh, I'm going to see what it looks like if I drink alcohol or like, what if wine is different? Or what if I do it in the morning versus night? Cause I usually do it at night. And it also gave me just tools for uh, communication with partners. So a lot of times I think like, having a conversation that's very honest is sometimes really hard with a partner. And I think a big one that I hear all the time is like, how much foreplay does someone need? And I think the cool thing was to be able to show like my partner, my grass and being like, Hey, like it just takes me like this amount of time with foreplay just for me. So imagine like if I'm in a partner situation, like there's a lot going on, like this is what I need. It just gave me the tools to kind of do that. And then we've also seen like, people who love and get excited by the idea of data. So like 
if you're like, hey, I was thinking about you, I use this data and then you send that data over to somebody, like that's been like a really cool thing for people to be like, oh, that's like super sexy. Yeah. Um, and one of the ones that I think really resonate with a lot of people, and we've seen this from all ages from we had a lady that was in her 70s who emailed us and was like, I just had my first orgasm because of the Linus and because oh you can see that data. And yeah. so I think a lot of times, like we don't talk about enough that women sometimes have a difficult time orgasming, like whether you've, if you've ever had one or like maybe some factor has changed in your life where suddenly you're having a harder time doing it. So that data actually shows you what parts you are the most aroused. And so you kind of keep building up to like, okay, like this is what felt good. So you can have that proof point and feel like you're kind of working towards reaching what feels good for you. And so, um, so yeah, there's like a broad range of, I think the different types of people from like our beloved kinky kind of communities to like, people who are just like, I just trying to understand my body or like why my body changed all of a sudden. Yeah. I love that. Just hearing all those different examples shows how data just can be so empowering. Right. And it's also like a way to like communicate. Like if you have a partner, they can visually see, oh, this is what's happening. Yeah. Usually yes. they don't really, they can't, you know, they don't understand. They don't know yeah. unless you. And yeah. even me, like, you know, like <laughs> I'm like in this space, but sometimes when you're talking to your partner and it's a really vulnerable conversation, like even for me, sometimes I'm like, okay, like this is what I'm going to say. And then I'm like, you know, you, there's, there's yeah. still a level it's, of it's like. It's hard to talk about certain things. Yeah. It's yeah. a vulnerability thing. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's fun to be able to lean on like, I don't know, my orgasm data to be like, hey. Yeah, like, just look at this. <laughs> like I've been yeah. so stressed lately and stress just really ruins it for me. Uh -huh. Like just, you know, like, and I think giving people that opportunity to have those conversations has been really nice. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to go back to your upbringing and your family because since you started Lioness and working on this, how has like, how has that relationship changed? Like, you know, with you and does, what does your family think? Mm. <laughs> so I will say, um, I, I, I'm sure a lot of like first gen, second gen Asian Americans can really relate to this as well. Like, uh, there's a level I'm an adult now, but there's a level of, how scared I am of my mom in, in a, in a way of just like, I don't know, like I've always grown up in a space where like, you know, your mom's like scary, like, so, or like your parents are scary. And so I, and I know she was so proud when I like graduated from UC Berkeley and then I went to Amazon and I really just had this feeling of like, I didn't want to disappoint or like, I didn't want to feel like a disappointment to her. And so, um, and I knew that this was like the biggest way like of financially contributing back into the family of like the parents that have raised you and sacrificed everything. And so actually when I quit Amazon, I had not, I had not told her that I quit. Like, I, and I think that was like a solid eight months where I didn't actually tell her that I was like, I left the company and I was working on the startup. And then I especially didn't want to tell her that I was working on a sex toy startup. I'm living in SF now. And so she's down in LA and she, I just wasn't reaching out as often as I usually would. And she was like, Hey, is everything okay? Like, can I come up and like visit? And I knew that that was maybe the moment that we should actually have a conversation and actually tell her. So I think just also as like a little backstory of like why I was so scared of my body was like I had experienced sexual trauma as a child. And so there was this like a feeling of like that I didn't really deserve to like love my body in that way. And because it mm -hmm. felt still associated to the trauma and like um, or like that I just didn't feel like I owned my body. And this was a thing that like my parents, like my family ended up knowing about growing up, but we really swept it under the rug. And so for me, it was like years of I highly recommend every like just years of therapy and just like working through that trauma. But I think the biggest thing was like my parents and I never talked about it after it had happened. And so when she came up to visit, I was like, okay, I'm just going to show her our office. Like at the time we were in a share, we had one desk at a shared office space with like 20 different companies. I had all these vibrators on the desk that are like torn down. Like some are like you know, like very phallic with veins and like all sorts of crazy stuff. And so she came and I was like, Hey, like, I just want to let you know, like I'm working on this uh, company and like, we're, we're doing it because we want to give people the power to like help them understand their body. And also it feels like a journey for me to like, feel like I'm fully embraced in my own sexuality and like all of that. And she was like, 
really quiet. And I was, I was really genuinely ready to be like, I don't know, have to deal with like the awkward silence of like her staying with me for like a couple days or whatever. And then she was like, you know, like when I was younger, I used to own a vibrator. And I was like, <gasps> wow. oh, okay. <laughs> and then uh-huh. for the next two hours, we talked about our sex lives. Like wow. she asked me when I lost her virginity. And then I like, we were talking so openly about like just everything. Like she was giving me advice. I was giving her advice. Like it was like the most beautiful, disgusting thing <laughs> I've ever done. <laughs> Wow. Cause, yeah, because it's so much in the sense of like, it's beautiful that I, that's a conversation I never thought I'd have with my mom. But then it's disgusting because, you know, at the end of the day, it's still your mom. And like, I've learned so many things that I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> where do I output this into the world? Like, yeah. I have to take it to my grave situation. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then, um, so she was, and I remember like just talking at the very end, she was like, you know, like, I always wondered like if you were going to be okay or like what would happen if you were ever going to be able to feel like comfortable with your own body or like be in a relationship, like all these things. And she was like, I'm just so glad that like you're okay. And I was like, yeah, like honestly, like I'm like happy. Like I feel like I'm in a really good place. And I told her like I definitely had like went through like my mental health journey and like gone through therapy and like all that. But like, I was like, this feels like kind of the biggest next steps for me to feel super just in control of my own body. And so it was so nice to have that conversation, even though we didn't even talk about it, like super in detail, like even just to have that to that interaction at that point, I think it really just settled a lot of things. And like, I will say like, Obviously, my mom is still an Asian mom at heart. She wants me to go back to corporate America and like <laughs> get a get a quote unquote real job. <laughs> so she's asking me all the time. But I think there's a level of like understanding that she's gotten from it. And I think as we've been in this company, we've been doing this company for six, seven years. Like she understands like like this is what I've been really working on and and all of that. So when we had our first product, like we were working for two years on developing our first product. I was in China, like I grabbed that first package that came off the line and I like flew back to LA and I was like, here, I was like, I gave it to my mom because I was like, this is super. I was like, I, if you've ever, ever wondered like why I'm like not sleeping, not eating, like all these things, like this is the product that I've been working on. So do I know if she's used it? No. Do I want to know? <laughs> you haven't really. It up. <laughs> <laughs> she yes. has her own data. She's. I know. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. As I'm like, okay, our like we have really strict privacy policies because I was like, my people that own it that I don't want to know if they use it. You oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I feel grateful that we are. I think in an understanding space and like my now my grandparents know about it my dad knows about it my brother's always been like a number one supporter from the early days so yeah so it's been it's been definitely nicer than expected because I know that's like a fear that a lot of us talk about is like what are my parents going to think like can I really do this jump that is a career that my parents won't understand for sure Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. First of all, that the fact that you and your mom had that conversation is huge because so many people would be like, I would not even know what that would like, what would happen if we talked about things like that. And then I'm also so happy for you just hearing that this is really kind of like a full circle empowering moment because you had that sexual trauma experience when you were younger. And now you're literally like owning your body, learning about your body. Like that's your job. And, and you're helping other women do that as well. I think that's so beautiful. Like, oh, thank you. Yeah, like it's it just been makes such sense, fun, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been such a fun. Like, I I really can't knock. Like, um, I probably like I have one of the funnest jobs I can imagine having, and yeah. like, um, yeah. Now it's like I post like my own data, like for the world to see, and all of that. <laughs> I know, so it's I like your TikTok. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's been. It's definitely like a nice full circle for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of women can relate to not knowing their bodies and not feeling comfortable with their bodies and sexuality. So what are your tips like with the mental health portion of it? Like how, I guess, yeah. What's your advice for women who feel that way? Yeah. So I, I, my, I think my team will always like yell at us for this because I am, we're like our worst salespeople (laughs) as founders. Cause when people are like, Oh, should should I buy the line? This is going to help me solve 
like all these problems or like, or like, is it going to make me have guarantee an orgasm? Like whatever the case may be. And I always have to tell people like, obviously I would love if you buy the Linus, but there's so many things I think that goes into just pleasure. And I always tell people like the first step in any of it is like, figuring out what feels good for you. And it doesn't mean like sexually, like I just mean like what makes you feel like in a place where you feel safe and you feel like you can really be in touch with your own body or just feel like in a comfortable space. So I'm like, if it means that you have to take a nice bath and you're like, watch your favorite TV show, like know that about yourself and like do all the things that like, if you do want to have that sexual experience or like you want to masturbate and like, do all those things that make you put you in a good mental space and like just a good feeling of your own body and feeling like very in control of your own body and space. And so I always tell people like, I think that's the, that's really the thing that I would want to tell people is like one, like knowing about your own body and like knowing just what works for you. And then also just like feeling good. And so I'm always, you know, like I think a tip, a common one is like, oh, use a mirror to see what your vulva, your vagina, like clitoris, like all those look like. And I, I, I understand it's like a lot, a little bit like some people are like, that's like kind of weird. But like, I understand in the sense of like, it is very much getting in touch with like what your whole body is and like what, you know, that you get to embrace like you as a full person. And so, um, and like a fun fact, there's a couple of researchers that have been studying this is like, uh, people during orgasm, the, the way your vulva looks and your clitoris looks and your, uh, your pelvic floor muscles move, it actually changes how it looks. So they're saying Mm -hmm. that visually it will look different. And I'm always like, that's so cool. Like people should know more of that or like, I don't know, watch your, watch the mirror (laughs) while you're doing it next time. Like, Yeah. yeah, like it gets like, it gets to be like a fun space of like being curious about your own body. Mm, I I love that advice. I also agree. I think it's it's the key word like feeling safe, right? Feeling safe in your body because I think so many people like feel tense or uncomfortable and it just reminds me cuz t- typically in my life I am very, you know, I'm very busy and like there was this a couple years ago like I went to Bali like on a solo trip, like kind of like a eat pray love sort of thing. And in Bali you can get really like cheap affordable massages and so I got like a massage every day and I have never felt like sexier (laughs) so relaxed and wow I never feel like this I 100% I always thought I was not a massage person and I think it was one because it was just so expensive I never felt like (laughs) I was like oh it's like such an expensive but I I was the same like I think in Bali I probably got my first massage and I was like my god this feels amazing (laughs) like wow I have not been relaxed and wow I a lot of women maybe they feel out of touch with their body because they're they're missing that's some sort of practice that helps them get to that point yeah because sometimes it feels like a chore to feel good about your body which is so unfortunate but yeah I think that's something especially like women we have to like really check in with and being like okay like like I think even the question of like oh like maybe you should practice I, my, ther- my therapist is like oh maybe you should practice meditation I was like oh it just sounds like a homework assignment. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's silly to think about it in that way for sure. Yeah. Okay. So moving on. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, you say you reach research a lot of sex, like data and information. So I'm sure you know so many things. I'm curious, can you share either surprising things that you've learned? Um, maybe some things that women don't know, but should know. My favorite one, I think the one that I probably use the most often is uh, there's been a study, I think this one was done in 2012, I want to say, that number feels right to me, but um, they surveyed over like 2000 women and basically on like vibrator use in relationships and how it kind of, so there's different ways to measure like sexual satisfaction, but in a survey form, one of the coolest ways is uh, it's called the FSFI scale. So um, it stands for female sexual function index. And so there's different subcategories of like, uh, lubrication, arousal, orgasm, like, um, 
but yeah, like different, there's like different subcategories and you can like, re- you, it's a self-reported survey, but the s- survey basically showed like when you own a vibrator in a relationship and your partner knows about the vibrator and likes that you use a vibrator, it actually statistically significantly increases your sexual satisfaction in a relationship. And so I probably pull that one the most often because the question we get all the time is like, well, if I'm in a relationship why do I need a vibrator? Or mm-hmm. if yeah. if it's a heterosexual relationship, typically uh, cishet men are very like, oh, like I wouldn't want my significant other using a vibrator like that. Like they don't, that's a replacement of me, like all these things. But it, like vibrators are such collaborators, not competitors. And so um, I always pull that study is like in, in especially like lesbian and bisexual relationships, there's like a higher chance that the partner knows about the vibrator and likes the vibrator use and they've just have so much higher sexual satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's a really big one. And then, uh, I think we talk about it a lot, but in the case, in case like we, like, if you want to actually know that there's research around the orgasm gap of like, um, cis men have just, it's like 90 something, like a high 90%, 90 something percent of, uh, men have orgasms versus 62% of women have orgasms. And so there's this huge discrepancy in orgasms in especially heterosexual relationships. And there's a lot of different theories as to like why that might be. But I think even for, I think in conversations with other people, like I think a lot of times we learn sex through the lens of somebody else, whether it's porn or if your partner had a sexual relationship before and so they're like kind of leading the way and you're like, this is what it should feel like versus what feels good for me. So I always have to tell people like, you you should feel a little selfish in like wanting to make sure you understand your pleasure and that your partner can h- help you fulfill that. And so I always like, those are my two favorite things I think to pull out. And then there's like fun little tidbit ones. Like there's a small study about uh, if cold feet like no, like literal cold feet like having uh-huh. socks on during sex as <laughs> your orgasms better I, oh the, that's the, funny yeah the Wait, sample size is does so, it <laughs> uh, I, so the sample Wait. size is really small but it does they did say it helps and their oh, theory is because it helps the circulation through your body <laughs> the study is okay. really really preliminary yeah, I actually yeah. did a tiktok it got pulled down but um I tried like putting ice on my feet versus like having really warm socks and it does help mainly because if you if you're just uncomfortable like if your feet are cold like it's just hard to concentrate on the pleasurable part so I can I can believe it <laughs> <laughs> okay um but moving on I do want to do a little like sex toy 101 you know like busting some myths maybe because I'm sure you know a lot about that um I guess number one what are some things women should know about sex toys I think that sex toys are awesome. (laughs) Is that a good uh, fact? But sex toys are awesome. But also I think um, being very mindful of the materials that it's made out of. So uh, uh, the sex toy industry is unfortunately not FDA regulated as it should be, but it is not. So you can basically build anything and then the way it's categorized is as a novelty device. So when you put it into market, they can be like, oh, it's novelty. It's not actually meant to be inserted into your body, which is really oh, unfortunate. It but can be dangerous, right? Yeah, like some yeah. out there. There's like oh. and that's why like there's the ones that are like and I would the general rule of thumb is like if it's silicone, if it's glass, or if it's metal, those are all non-porous and perfect to use for uh, as, as sex toys. If it's anything that looks like a clearish jelly looking thing, if it's jade, I know jade has become really popular. Like those are all porous materials, and so you can't ever clean it fully, and it's gonna like harbor bacteria. So I always say like stick to your your silicones your glass and your metals and then if it's like jelly like and it's like has that translucent clearish color like those are the ones that melt and all that so I would steer clear of it another question that comes up is like there are so many options and as a woman it could be really overwhelming and confusing so like what is what are your tips on that oh yes I as a person that is now probably owned I have like I'm like looking at my shelf is like boxes I have like boxes of different ones okay Um, how many toys have you tested oh that's a good question I should really I should really 
uh, count, but I I must have I think probably at least like a hundred. Wow! <laughs> because either we like have purchased it over the years, and we all like yeah. have tried them, and just to know what they feel like, or like all these, and then new ones release all the time. Um, but it, yeah, a good chunk. And I I I will also be very honest that I probably only use like four on rotation that I genuinely just love for myself and some are like oh like I'll use it one day or I lost a charger it's a very classic (laughs) story of owning too many vibrators but um wait so the question so the question was it's yeah out of so many choices what are your tips for women on like how to start exploring if they're new to this yeah that's it so I would always say and I know this is not accessible for everyone but if there is a sex toy shop around you especially one that's like very open and friendly. Like, uh, like in California, we have good vibrations and pleasure chests. Um, I know in New York, there's Babeland. There's like these stores that are much like we've kind of shifted in the, in from the dark seedy, Mm -hmm. like scary sex toy shops to these like really beautiful, really well knowledgeable stores. So if there is one near you, like you don't ever have to feel like you have to purchase something, but but they'll have all these different displays. So you can kind of go around, like touch what feels good for you, what's like, you're like, oh, this sensation is something that I would want to try, like, and things like that. So I would say like going from that, reviews, I would be like, I feel like mixed about because there's going to be a lot of reviews that are like, this is going to be amazing. And then like, it doesn't work for you. And then you're Mm -hmm. like, what the heck? Like, everyone's body's different, right? Yeah, exactly. It's hard to just read off reviews, right? Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I would go for like, start narrowing down on things like, well, do you know what kind of material you'd want it to be made of? Do you want it to be rechargeable? What's your price point? Um, And that will narrow down quite a bit. And like, even colors, like if you have a color preference, like that'll narrow it down a bit. And then going into like figuring out what sensations you like. Um, And if you do have a store near you like being able to like ask that person I think when I I sometimes go in and like I really like these like deep rumbly motor vibrations like which one do you like and she's you know like the store person will be like oh like we just got one in that I like I think it's amazing like like those people are such wealth of knowledge that I'm I'm very like um yeah if you can have a space where that exists in your area like please do it Yeah. I think it's a lot of women are just afraid to even take that first step. And it's like, you know, walking into a sex shop by yourself or something. It's, it is scary. So what are your tips on just how overcoming that, that barrier? Mm, I think maybe you can always like look at it on I I've, I do this sometimes too. Cause I'm like a semi anxious person, like even restaurants, if I like pick a restaurant and I don't know anything about the restaurant, I like Look at photos of the interior, the exterior, what's the parking situation, what's like the food. I don't know. I'd like do this. Yeah, I need to like slightly prep myself. If it's like a, if it's a place that's going to make me anxious if I go really unknown. Um, But I think one that and then also like uh, go with friends, like go with friends that you trust in that, like you're going to have a good time. Like even if it's just one other person, it makes the experience so much more fun and disarming. I think I can understand if you're like on only like the only person that goes and then the store person's like do you need any help and you're like I'm just looking you know yeah and you can always tell the store person like I'm just looking like uh, this is kind of my first time I and either you can accept their help to help you like walk you through the whole store or just let them know and I think people will be very respectful of that like everyone knows like sex toys shops is not always the most comfortable experience um, when you first go in and it's scary. But yeah, so like uh, these stores will respect that. And then I think just have like fun with it for sure. Mm -hmm. Love that. All right. Now let's bust some myths uh, about sex toys. Um, I mean, one myth that comes to mind is like some people like do vibrators like numb your, you, you, you know what I mean? Like, is that true? Is it false? What are your thoughts on that? Yes. So that's probably the biggest fear we get if, if it's not like, oh, it's going to replace a man. Like that's the first fear. And then the second one is like, oh, it's going to make it harder to orgasm if I only use my hands or with my partner. Um, so multiple research papers, I think over the years have shown that there's no, you don't lose sensitivity in the clitoris from uh, vibrator use, like regular vibrator use. The two things that could happen is if it is like, a super, super strong vibrator, like I'm talking like a Hitachi magic wand times like three, 
like it for the temporary, you might get a feel a sense of numbness for like the day because it's like such an in- t- intense vibration, but it'll always come back. And then um, the other one is that if you, if, if you have a specific way that you like to masturbate and say it is a toy, like a very specific toy, like you get used to a style of masturbating. So I think what people are experiencing is a, is a style of masturbating that you've gotten really used to. And so anything else feels like it's not working for you, but it's because you have a style that's kind of worked for you and you've gotten used to versus like, it's not because you've lost sensitivity in the clitoris or your vagina or anything like that. Mm, I see. Okay. Um, what is another big myth? I mean, the other one that you brought up was like, people are afraid to like, you know, bring a sex toy into their relationship because they think it might replace the partner. Yeah, that definitely like the idea of like, is bringing a sex toy into my relationship going to be an issue? And that's like a thing like research has shown multiple times that it, uh, people have better sexual satisfaction when there is a vibrator involved or, and I think it's because it also correlates to the fact that it probably means in that relationship, you have more openness and communication of your Mm, wants and just like dislikes and things like that. So highly, like, I think, you know, at the end of the day, everything is like communication based of like what works, what you would like to try and all of that. Um, some other myths about sex toys, I think, um, oh, maybe like, uh, things about Kegels, which is so it was related to sex toys in a lot of ways. Like people always ask me, like, should we be doing Kegels every day? Should I buy this toy that's a Kegel exerciser? And I always have to like calmly, but I have a whole rant on it, is that <laughs> you should absolutely not be doing them unless you've been directed by a, a physical therapist, a pelvic floor therapist, or your OBGYN or doctor that you should be doing it because – um, if you're doing it just from verbal instruction alone, or like you've seen it on TikTok, saw someone saying you should do it. Um, there's been studies that show that when you don't have proper instruction, you're probably not doing Kegels correctly. And so you're doing more harm than good. So you're, the whole idea of a Kegel is to actually, uh, practice both, uh, both getting tight, like tightly squeezing, but also fully relaxing your muscles. And most people only think about getting like tighter. And so like, because this cultural stigma of like, oh, tighter is better, like all these things, which is also complete BS. So, um, so yeah, so a lot of times for Kegels, people only are practicing the squeezing part. So there was a really great, um, physical pelvic floor therapist we talked to and she, the way she described it is like, say you're doing like bicep curls. So most people are like only holding that curl, but they're not doing the full range of relaxing right. the muscle. And, and so, so what does that create? Just more tenseness down yeah, there? Yeah. So you actually cause more pain. You can cause more pain during sex because now you're having a hard time knowing how to relax those muscles. And really like the people that should be doing is like usually post-pregnancy, if you're having like urinary incontinence or like pelvic floor prolapse, those are kind of the reasons you'd be doing them. But if you're just doing them because you're like, oh, I want my partner to feel like I'm tighter or like being tighter is cool. Like all those things are complete myths. And I like, I'm very like, do not do Kegels until, unless someone has told you that you should be doing them or you're trying to fix a uh, issue that you're having with your body. Yeah. That's a good one to like a good myth to bust because I've heard about Kegels and I think a lot of people just hear about it. And so they try it out and do it without any professional, like, you know, no advice from anyone else. So yeah, that's a good one. Yes. Kegel talk is like a whole thing. I I see it sometimes that they're like, oh, you should be doing your Kegels if you're listening to this, like listen to this song and do it to the beat. And like, I'm very scared of uh, TikTok communities coming after me, but I, I'm not a fan of that one because it's, it's, yeah, you're teaching people. You can't teach someone in a minute from a speed of a song and like why people like there's no explanation of why you should be doing it, all that stuff. So yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> is there anything that women should be doing with their bodies that we don't know? Like I, I I'm all, I feel like you just have so much knowledge and we're like, oh, we don't know anything. <laughs> Tell us what you know. Girl, I don't know anything. Sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes I, sometimes I'm also like, I think the funniest thing is like um, with like new partners or like, if I'm like talking to somebody, sometimes I feel like I don't know any, like, I don't know anything all of a sudden, because like, this for me is such like a, like, I'm also learning as I go kind of thing. And like, I'm just trying to put out as much information I've learned and like the amazing 
researchers and doctors who have told me really cool things, like I'm relaying the message. But um, I, I think really the biggest thing is like, the thing that you should be doing with your body is like just knowing what it is and like what it looks like, how it functions. Like, I think the most helpful thing for me is like, no, like for some people, stress makes their orgasms better because it's like a release of stress. For me, I've learned like when I'm stressed, like one, the orgasms suck and I don't even want to be bothered to do like have sex or masturbate or anything like, and those are kind of powerful things to know about yourself. And so like, even if you don't know anything about sex, like know what sex means to you or like pleasure means to you and your body versus like, you're like talking, I don't know, like, yeah, like, I don't think it has to be like dictionary terms of like, you know, like, oh, how should someone have better sex or what's a position you should do, but it should be about you, like what positions do you like, or what things are you interested in? Because I think no one has to be an expert in this space. It's more just about you. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I kind of want to ask you about your TikTok strategy because your brand blew up through your TikTok. Um, how do you plan your content? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I have a horrible answer for it. (laughs) It's, and it's, uh, we've talked to like a few agencies now of like figuring out, but then everyone's like, we don't know how to help you because you've kind of done this in a very non-strategic way. (laughs) <laughs> and it's and it's really that like um I really believe I was in a right place at the right time situation where uh TikTok it was during the pandemic during the lockdown and I was already obsessed with TikTok. I was like, mm-hmm. everything is so funny, everyone is so funny, <laughs> like everyone is so creative, and I was so excited about it. And then um there was a prompt that I was like, what did you study? And then what do you do for a living now? And then someone, the person that had stitched that video that went viral was like, oh, I was, a, uh, I think working as an aerospace engineer at NASA and now I'm a beekeeper. And that video went like insanely viral. And I was like, wait, I do something weird. And so I had posted it and then, um, I had all my notifications off. Like I didn't, you know, like it was TikTok, like I wasn't doing anything on it. And then that night I was like cooking dinner and I saw like my Instagram going off and then like our sales page, like just keep getting pings. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. And I was like trying to figure it out. And it was just that, that video had picked up. And I think because of that, I was like, um, oh, like I've always wanted to do things like things I've learned about sex or like things that sex education never taught us or like as if I was like talking to my friends at a bar because my friends have asked me so many questions and I'm like, oh, let me tell you the answer to that or like a research paper I read on it. And so that really became kind of the vehicle of like, oh, I'm just going to put these little tidbits of things I've learned because what seems like one-on-one to me now is like, of of course, not one-on-one for most people. And then also I think because I started posting my orgasm data and like people started getting really engaged of like, I was like, here's what it looks like after I had a ton of caffeine and people were like, (laughs) wait, can you try if you did it with this? And like, I think giving people that opportunity to see me explore myself in a weirdly not sexual way and like just posting a graph and like talking about it in such a matter of fact way, I think it really just kind of attached to people and like kind of resonated with a lot of people. And so I do everything that I think they say you're supposed not supposed to do on TikTok is like I post, I haven't posted in about like two, three months, I think at this point. Um, and I've used to only post like once every month. And then, and it was because like, I just didn't have the time or effort to want to do it all the time. And then, uh, it was just anytime, like I thought of an idea or like someone on my team was like, oh, you've done it with like CBD. Why don't you just post it? And I was like, oh yeah, I should totally do that. And so um, it, I did it out of like pure, like it was an outlet for me to feel a little bit funny. Like I've always wanted to be funny. So I was like, okay, I want to do this. And then also just, yeah, things I've learned over the years. Like if I'm like, oh, I should do one on, I actually recently asked to give out one on why missionary position is called missionary position. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> right. um, so yeah, like I, whenever I have an idea, like I will put time into doing it, but it's, it was definitely like a, completely organic, non-strategic way of doing it. Um, but very grateful of like the community that it's built and the people that have been just so nice. Cause I think that was my biggest fear is like, I never wanted to be public facing. And I was like, I always was like, Oh, I want to be an engineer. Like, I don't want to do anything public facing. And then TikTok tends to have sometimes very mean people on it. I was like, so scared of like, I don't know, people being like mean, but 
like I we've been so lucky that we've just had the nicest people who have just been such big cheerleaders for us and just like super encouraging and all of that. And so I've I've gotten really nice messages like I think because of it and I'm like so grateful for the the community that's been built around it. Yeah. Okay, I love hearing that that it just happened organically and you just create whatever you're like inspired to create because it does feel very organic and natural on your oh, TikTok. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It is like it's very I think, real, but that's what people relate to. Like, yeah. you didn't have like, it's, it wasn't super planned, right? No, it's never mm. super planned. I mean, I think it should be more planned at some point, <laughs> but um, like I wasn't even like, someone was like, oh, you should get a ring light. And then I was like, oh, like, cause I was just doing it when there's daytime. And I was like, if it's, if it was like 7 PM and it was dark and I was like, I guess I'm not going to post one today. So um, yeah. So I think it's been, it's been good. I think I could definitely be better about it and like a little bit more like on it. But um, yeah, I'm glad it feels like organic. And yeah, it was just me being like, I want to put things out there that I've learned that I think is so cool. Yeah. I mean, what are your plans for your marketing strategy moving forward? Because like your TikTok is your face and your name. But where like, I, I was curious, is that the strategy just like for you to, to be that face? Or I don't know, how are you moving? moving forward with marketing? So marketing in the sex tech space is really interesting. Um, it's, it's so if technically TikTok doesn't allow sexual content either, unless it's educational, but it's very gray of what educational means. So I get my videos flagged all the time. Like even if I just say the word vibrator, it'll get flagged. And so on Instagram, we can't do ads. Facebook, we can't do ads. So every traditional path of how an e-commerce company grows is uh, something that sex tech companies can't do. Okay. So it's interesting in the sense of like, well, for marketing, like what are the strategies for a sex tech company like Linus to grow? Um, I think the biggest things we've done and we will continue to do is we used to write a lot of blog posts on 101s and 201s of like different sex things, not even having to do with sex toys, like pegging like like what does that look just like squirting yeah. yeah and just like putting that information out find there. you through the blog yeah post. and then also um yeah doing organic content like this like on our instagram and then mm-hmm. now on tiktok um and then also just doing a lot of like people facing things so like in what before the pandemic we we're doing a lot of like in-person events or like panels and stuff like that um, and then just like continuing to do like press outlets and stuff. And I think one of the f- more fun things that we've done is um, we, so vibrators, you can't advertise. So we actually made a dog toy that looks like our Linus vibrator. And then, cause we had this thing of like, people use a lot of uh, influencers to like, you know, hold the product and whatever. But then a lot of times people were like, oh, I don't want to do sex toys because my audience leans yeah. younger. Yeah. And then we had this idea of like, you know what people love posting is like pets. And then (laughs) like we get so many emails about dogs eating vibrators. Like it's, it's extremely common. And so we were like, we should make a dog toy because I bet you people will post their dog with the vibrator because it's not them. And so that was like kind of a fun one that we've done. So we, I think you have, like, we have to have fun with it and we have, it keeps us being very creative with our marketing strategies because we don't really do the traditional path of like what you're supposed to do in marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought about that. It is true. Like if sex toys aren't allowed to advertise, like how do people find out about it? And I think that's why it's, it's been harder for this industry to become more modernized. It it, it already is, but it's like happening at a slower pace than other brands because of this blockage, right? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And I think why there's not as much innovations as there would be in any other tech product. Like, and I, mm-hmm. that, and plus the taboo, like investors sometimes don't want to touch the, touch the space and all of that. So it's still like, I think cultural as a culture and as society, we still have so much to move on, but um, yeah, it's a, it's, I, with all that said, I always tell people like, it's a fun industry if you're willing to like, uh, be cheeky about it and like, right. Find good you fight. just have to navigate it in, in a certain way. Oh, that's another thing I'm curious about since your industry is dominated by men. And also like as a company, you want to get, get investment money. Like how, I don't know, what are your experiences, <laughs> you know, as a, a female with a sex tech company? I think when we first started, um, we, cause I, we have a lot of factors of like, we were first time founders, which is not a popular 
investment space. We're hardware, which is a very unpopular space. And then on top of that, we're women founders and then our team is almost entirely women. And then we are a sex toy company, like a sex toy How big company. is the team? I'm just curious. We're seven people full time. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So small, very small. <laughs> still a solid amount. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so I think when we first started, like, because we also didn't know what we were doing um, and we were in Silicon Valley kind of space. So people were like, oh, these are, you have to go to the top VCs and all of that. And we had a very shocking experience of like, you know, people, like we would build the hardware out. If it was any other hardware company, like the amount of how fast and how li- with how little money we did it is like an incredible feat. But people would be like, oh, I don't want to touch it. Or being like, oh, my wife would never use that. Or like never use a vibrator. And I'm like, your wife's lying to you. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um, Or it would be things like, oh, like they would, it would be a team of all men and the, on the investment side. And then they would bring in, for example, an executive assistant who was the only woman on the team and put this poor person on the spot of being like, oh, like, do you use fibers? And I'm like, don't ask her that kind of like, I was like, that's not part of her job. Like, this is your, like you as a professional investor, like should know the industry and space, like all of that stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, so we've definitely had weird experiences where people are like, oh, like, oh, you guys must be like in the, se-, you know, just all sorts of those comments. Um, I think the nice thing is that really taught us how to be smarter. And I think uh, work harder in the space of not dealing with people like that. And so um, I think we've grown and I tell this, I tell this to my co-founder now, like it took me like the five solid five years, but I feel like we're now in a space where I feel so confident in what we've built and so proud that I would never let an investor like do something that doesn't fly with us and being like now coming from a space of like, this is how incredible we are. This is how, what we've built we've already been selling, we're crushing it. Like this is all the stuff that's been amazing for us. Like you're either want to join us or like, don't join us at all. Like, and so I I think it changed the shift in like how we meant like our mentality around investing. But I mean, I would never sugarcoat it of being like, Oh, like it's fine. Like everyone should, you know, like it still is a tough space, but I think like there are the incredible people who will champion, I think the space and like believe in the idea, but surround yourself with those people. And like, just because somebody is a big name investor and you're like, I need to, you know, convince this person, like sometimes it's not worth it because it's better to get people that truly believe in your vision. Yeah. Do you find that a lot, like it was more women that resonated with your company, like female investors or like to be honest, it's a little bit, it's a little mixed. Um, and I, I, and I also come from, I think like, I think women in STEM and women in leadership positions are changing more now. And I, it's cool to see that, but like, I would say like seven years ago. And then I think when I was in college, like it was, it was still kind of, a like fighting for your spot, I think mm-hmm. almost I unfortunately. Think. And so, yeah. I would say like, oh, sometimes women investors would have this thing of, well, I can't invest in this because then everyone is going to pigeonhole me into being that investor that only does sex toys or only does women's products. And then all these other femtech companies will come and like now I have to just do this versus I want to do like big tech or like AR, VR, like, you know, and so I don't blame um, at all. Like I understand it in the sense of like, you're working hard to try to get in a place where you can sit with everybody, like everyone else on the team. And so it's mixed. I would say like, sometimes I think, yeah, some women investors are incredible. And they're like, I totally get this. I understand why. And I would say generally women tend to understand our product way faster of being like, Oh, I totally understand why this exists, like, and why it's amazing. Um, And then, yeah. So I would say some little bit of mix of both. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So what would you say are your future goals for yourself and Lioness? Specifically for Lioness and like for just, I think me, I'm so like unraveled into Lioness as a whole. And so 
Like we just want to be able to help people understand their bodies and expand the research in the space. So one of the biggest things now is that we have the world's largest data set on female sexual function, um, bigger than any other research institution or a, a medical institution. And so we actually want to really focus on putting out more research studies that actually validate more types of people and experiences and more diverse and inclusive of, you know, people, people that are older going through menopause or like people post-pregnancy. And so our whole goal with Linus is to like help people understand their bodies and sexual pleasure, no matter who you are or what you look like. Um, and I, and a very like particular one for me is like, uh, one of the biggest things I've noticed when I read research papers is a lot of times when there's the demographic uh, split and like ethnic split, split, like it's usually typically white Caucasians are the most studied, whether it's because they just they're in an area where it's really dominant. So the people that participate in the studies tend to be that. But there are really, really little studies on people of color, especially around sexual pleasure, sexual function. And then I would have to assume like in Asian, like I think I've dug kind of deep into like Asian sexual wellness and sexual pleasure and it's super limited space. Yeah. So I definitely want to see that, like I think continuing and just like expanding that research. And I want Linus to be able to be on the forefront of really helping push that. And then, um, so yeah, I think really like, I just, I think we want to just be unraveled in like sexual pleasure for all and like the science and research behind every single part of it. Um, and then I think, yeah, life goal for me is just like, or big thing for me is like, um, yeah, getting into a place where I feel like I never meant, I never meant to be an entrepreneur. Like it was not in my goal to be like, I want to like start my own company or whatever. And so, uh, for me, like Linus is the reason or like, I'm so passionate about this. Like, this is all I can imagine myself doing as a, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, this is all I can imagine doing. So I think um, carrying that forward and like seeing it be a part of the, my life and like all of that, I think would be really, really amazing. Yeah, I would love to yeah. do that. I think your mission is amazing. And I can see you like taking this so far, like with Lioness, because with that data, like imagine all the new knowledge, like that will come out from your research and studies. And it's, I don't know, I think that's huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I really hope like, I think that's like the hope is like, um, like with the story of like the athlete who had a concussion, like, I would love doctors to come and being like, Oh, you know what, like, we've learned like, you might you might experience like sexual dysfunction for a little bit because of the concussion. Like how amazing would it be if your doctor already knew that and could say that to you versus you're like, what's going on? Like, why is my body weird? Oh, like now, not only am I having this brain injury, now I'm having like sexual dysfunction. <laughs> you don't correlate the two. And so it'd be really cool. I think to like, yeah, go into a space where people just can talk about their bodies and sexual yeah. pleasure in a way that's just like, oh yeah, like, you know, might happen or like this is how you can be mindful of it it's just the fact that that topic like your sexuality and orgasm it's it's so like private and even if people experience something they don't share it and so yes. the fact that you're yeah now you're collecting data you're like unearthing so many secrets <laughs> so many like secret knowledge that can help a lot of people so I think that's really exciting yeah that's I hope so and I hope it's especially like me being really open as possible some people are like oh can I ask you a question I'm like yes ask me anything and like it's, I don't care if it's my Uber driver or like my bartender, like if they find out what I do and they're like curious, I'm like, okay, if I can answer the question, I will absolutely answer the question. Yeah. You must be so fun at parties. Like <laughs> people are asking you everything. Either fun or sometimes people avoid me because they're like, I'm scared of this sex. Oh, they're like, like, <laughs> <laughs> I just love the energy you bring because you make it feel so welcoming, open and positive. Like, I think we need to have more conversations with that energy instead of sex being this like secret thing that people don't like. To totally, talk about. totally. Mm -hmm. I agree. But yeah, like, I think like you bring like, I'm so like grateful of you bringing me onto your platform and like having this open conversation. Like, I think that's the, that's like the steps we take to like really change the cultural shift, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have any final words of advice you want to share with our listeners? Maybe some... I don't know, some tips for them to become more comfortable with themselves and their sexuality. I think just like give yourself the permission to explore, like whatever it is, like whatever, if it's a kink and you're like, oh, like, or like what kinks are out there, like give yourself the chance to even Google it or 
if you're like, I wonder if other people like, I don't know, have sex in this way or like masturbate in this way, like just give yourself the chance to like, even just open that little tiny door of like being curious. And my whole thing is like, I think of planting those seeds, whether it sprouts or not, or it sprouts a year from now, like giving yourself the chance to put those seeds down, I think is the best way to feel slowly comfortable with your own pleasure. Amazing. Okay. Where can we find you online? On Instagram, um, I'm Anna is average. On TikTok, I'm Anna the average. <laughs> this is one of those okay. things that are like, a little confusing. You need to fix this. And yeah, my the, everyone I talk to is like, you need to fix this. But um, and then all and then all of our for Linus is uh, every social media is Linus Health, and it's Linus like a female lion. And then our website is Linus.io. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast yes, today. Thank you. I had so fun. much fun. Yay. I hope we all learned. <laughs> we did. We learned a lot. And everybody listening, make sure you check out Anna. I'll link everything in the show notes. Check out her and Lioness. Such good work. I'm I'm so proud of you. Just as an oh, Asian American <laughs> female, just seeing what you're doing and being like courageous enough to do this and speak about it. Oh, appreciate you. That's super nice. <laughs> 